a new world and a new school, teaching and learning during and after the pandemic. What needs to change in education? How will the online world transform the peer relations as we know them today? Are we competent enough to navigate digital education and how to gain necessary skills? And finally, what is the new role of school and parents in education? These are essential points for millions of teachers and students around the world. Let's talk about it. Digital, digital well-being well and, and cyber security. Join, Join me and me my guests for the online, online debate. debate. Jenna Malankan, Catherine McCracken, Rachel, Rachel Henricks, Anna Lipczynska, Łukasz Gierek and, and Martin Metzler. Questions that matter and points, points that can that make a change. change. Consulate of the United States, States Cities, Cities on Internet, Internet Association, Association, Gulf Coast, Coast Diplomacy and Alumni Association. Join us and share your point of view. And you can do it now. So what is the COVID and post-COVID experience of K-12 schools in Poland and in the US? Hello and welcome to this debate. This is a forum where we discuss issues that are critically important for schools and education during this extraordinary time of uh, the new normal being born. Still a lot of questions, open questions that await reasonable answers, uh, but if they are to take us to uh, as societies to a better future, they need to be well grounded and, and based on real challenges as we can identify them. We examine these challenges and come up with uh, conclusions, not only for, uh, for educators also, but not only for education, but, but also for those who make decisions on political levels. So we take it a step uh, forward. Last time we talked about remote learning in, in various aspects. Uh, this time we will focus on something that lies at the very, very heart of the new digital education, that is digital well-being and cybersecurity. So this debate is uh, organized by Cities uh, on Internet Association in partnership with uh, Consulate General of the United States in Krakow, as well as Gulf Coast Diplomacy, NASC and Alumni Association. And what's important, the outcome of, of, of this series will become a report, finally, uh, that will, I hope at least, uh, be looked by the authorities uh, that are responsible for designing and organizing education, both in Poland and in the US. So what is the psychological cost of lockdown? How do we cater for our digital well-being? how to support teachers and students, of course, or just to look at it from a bit of a different perspective. Uh, did anyone actually gain anything on COVID? Let's find out. Let me open this discussion with an introduction from Amy Steinman from the American Consulate, who's uh, uh, with us and joined us today. Hello, Amy, nice to see you again. You too, Greg, thank you so Hi. much. Hello. Hello, everyone. So good afternoon, good day on behalf of the US Consulate in Krakow. It's truly a pleasure to be with you and to introduce today's virtual discussion on a very critical and timely topic affecting students, youth, and educators worldwide. Digital technologies have played a truly transformative role in the pandemic. And we are incredibly fortunate that despite these difficult and challenging times, we have the technology and the platforms which have enabled us to maintain connections, to continue educating our students, to telework, and to conduct important business, all virtually from our own homes. Digital technologies expand the boundaries of information, enable users to contribute to the knowledge economy, and enhance our productivity. But they can also carry significant risks for people's well being, especially students and youth. The threats include everything from cyberbullying to breaches of online security and privacy. So the question is, how do we harness the benefits of digital technology while mitigating the risks? How do we help our students build healthy digital habits and be responsible digital learners? Educators and educational institutions certainly have a role to play in helping students manage their online lives. We need to build our capacity to better teach students the critical thinking, media literacy, and communication skills 
that they need to flourish online. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing these ideas discussed, debated, and dissected over the next hour and a half. And I'm especially pleased to have American panelists represented here, sharing their experiences and best practices with Polish counterparts and vice versa. Because despite the distances between us, we are all united by these common experiences, mm -hmm. these universal challenges, and hopefully by mutual solutions. So Greg, I'll turn it over to you and I look forward to hearing from the panelists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. That was Amy Stein and nice uh, of you to, to join us each time we do these uh, debates. Thanks very much. Now here's a team of our speakers today, excellent speakers, Jenna Melanco, the founder and executive director Gulf Coast Diplomacy. Hello, Jenna. C can we hear each other? Yeah, well, you, you, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. That's fine. Perfect. Catherine McCracken, top 10 international baccalaureate program graduate. And I have just learned uh, doing theatre and politics. Yes. Do you, do you remember it correctly? Yes, correct. that's correct. Uh, Rachel Hendricks, executive director of international affairs for the University of West Florida's Division of Academic Engagement and Student Affairs. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hi, Nanna Rivczyńska from Poland, head of the uh, Digital Education Department at NUSK and coordinator of the Polish Safer Internet Center. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Łukasz Gierek, uh, MIE expert and a teacher at the same time at the Radom Technical School. Hello, Łukasz. Hello. And Marcin Mechla, ICT expert for Cities on Internet Association. So hello. we are all... Uh, we are all uh, there for the debate to start and we kick off with a short presentation about uh, about the subject from each side, so about 10 minute presentation. And on the Polish side, we've got Anja Rywczyńska, the head of the Digital Education Department at NASC, uh, with a bunch of information for us. All right. Okay. Let me show you some slides. Okay, I miss so much the moment uh, from the far past when, when you've been showing presentation, you could see some people on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> believe Maybe. me, we are, we are here, we are here. <laughs> yeah, now I need to believe you and feel that you are there. <laughs> so hello everyone, um, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here in such a great company. Uh, I represent NASC uh, and NASC is one of the most active actors in Poland in fields of internet safety and security and among many, many um, other activities also coordinates Polish Safer Internet Center, uh, which is a European project aimed at raising awareness um, in internet safety and also fighting with illegal content. And I'm uh, telling that because most of the data that I will be showing now comes from uh, this um, the project activities, also the awareness part and the illegal uh, content um, reactions and reports. I would like to divide my short presentation into three areas. And, uh, one area will be about online uh, threats. Uh, second area will be about the online life uh, in the age of uh, COVID-19. And also the, the third part will be about the um, well-being. And I would like to start with some identified risk uh, factors, which unfortunately have reflected, um, are reflected in the statistics that you can see uh, below. So definitely now we talk about the increased risk of exposure to harmful contact via social media, in-app chats, online games. Uh, the loneliness and isolation of children um, have absolutely potential to expose them to people who would like to use them also in a sexual uh, way. Uh, spending more time online, often without responsible uh, supervision of, um, of adults, of parents, of teachers, uh, can foster also child um, grooming as well as sexual extortion. And now also in a pandemic condition, it's much more difficult to see that something bad is happening with a child because the kids are excluded from social contacts. They don't participate in school activities. And usually, especially in Poland, the school is a place when most of cases 
mostly domestic violence are uh, often identified. And here you can see um, the compared data from 2019 and 2020 uh, in um, context of CSAM, which is child sexual abuse materials reported to Polish hotline uh, existing in NASC in frames of uh, Polish Safer Internet Center and responding to the illegal content. So here you can see the increase uh, by nearly 10% and it's very important because it happened despite a 12% lower number of received reports. So here we have increased in these in these reports about child sexual abuse materials. And also we have very um, a very sad phenomenon as well, self-generated content. This is the content produced by uh, kids, by young people. But of course, we are not saying it's a voluntary produced. Usually it happens because of some adult uh, pushing. So the number of such incidents also increased from 2002, from uh, 202 in 2019 to 355. So it's also a, a big uh, increase. And now staying in the uh, in the area of online threats, but now moving to the school reality, uh, I would like also to show um, it tell you uh, something about the cases um, that happened at schools, and it was the new challenge for Polish schools. Uh, this phenomena uh, came from the gaming environment, but here also, especially in the first few months of the remote um, learning, we could see the abuses that happened during um, online lessons. So the examples of that were playing loud music during lessons, malicious comments, mocking speakers, uh, modifications of recorded mm -hmm. materials, both uh, about teachers, but also including um, students. So it were the examples of cyberbullying. And also the most dangerous, uh, like sharing pornography, also hard, drastic materials, and presenting nudity, and so and, and, and etc. Uh, this risk were seated. Uh, I put here the name of the re of the report done by the University of Warsaw. These risk risks were seated as the greatest threats related to distance learning, both by teachers and and uh, children. And of course, in months, I, I I'm sure that some people representing schools uh, in this debate will. I have much more to say about that uh, during the, the conversation, but um, in months, teachers learned how to deal with this. Like, I mean, they, they were able to use some technical solutions, but at the beginning, it was very, very disturbing in, in, in Polish schools. Uh, okay, moving. And talking about um, online practices, somehow we have to say that our life moved uh, in front of the screen. And also it uh, caused uh, some problems that we see, especially with children and young people. Time, now I would like firstly to focus on time. We have 65% of children that spend more than six hours a day in front of the computer. And 20% of them spend even eight hours. And there is a huge group as well that spent 12 hours daily. And these are li really little kids, I mean, from primary schools, uh, also coming to the, the secondary school. But these are kids like 11, 12, 13 years old. It comes from the newest report um, done by NASC, uh, Teenagers 30 from 2020. Uh, that long, long time uh, in front of the screen also causes addictions. We have 21% of teenagers that have a high FOMO rate. And FOMO is the fearing of missing off. So these are kids that cannot go offline. They feel like they will lose something. It's very difficult for them to switch off their smartphone. Over 45% believe that they have been using smartphone for too long and over 21% have tried to reduce this time but without success. And also very important data, activity balance, up to 20% less physical activities. It also concerns uh, adults but especially uh, here in our concern are uh, young people and kid and um, children. And um, third area, well-being. Um, I think now in Poland we are in a really, really difficult situation. We are struggling, like like most of the world, I guess. We are struggling the third wave. Uh, we are struggling with the third lockdown. People are very tired. Um, it's necessary to say that for last months. Uh, it was an absolute digital revolution in Poland and the internet was absolutely our ally. And I would like to, to show here this, um, this data about over 80% of children that say that they used internet to keep relations with friends and family. Usually they would say they would keep relations with peers, but here also in, in these latest reports, they stressed they kept relations with the, their 
closest ones in their life so it was like something that saved us uh, somehow like amy said in the very beginning but at the same time uh, we have to go deeper into the results we see uh, 45 percent of young people that see no difference in relationship and then 25 percent see even improvement and about 17 see deterioration and from this data and it's um, repeated in many, many reports that they've seen in this data, we can see the huge responsibility on adults because we can see that both options were possible. You could reach something from this situation, but also you could you could lose. And now we have to focus on this uh, more more uh, dark side of the situation. Every fourth uh, high school student feels sad, lonely, depressed, and like wanting to cry. Nearly ten percent show clear symptoms of depression. Uh, but look here. 65% of teachers and more than half of parents, they say they feel worse mentally than before the pandemic. And I think this is the area that we have to be really focused on because we cannot talk about uh, well-being of kids, forgetting about the well-being of adults. It's like in a plane. First, you have to take care of yourself and then you will be able to take care of your kid. So I think this is the, the area that um, I hope during this debate we will also um, give some time. For me, it's, uh, it's really crucial. So thank you so much. I hope it was... I hope it was fast enough. <laughs> Yeah, that was absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. And on the American side, uh, uh, Rachel. Rachel Hendricks. Well, what you have to do is have, you have to unmute yourself. We can't hear because you switched oh, off your mic. Okay. That's, <laughs> no, no, that's good. All right. Uh, well, thank you. And um, thank you for having me. I represent uh, the Office of International Affairs here at the University of West Florida in Pensacola, Florida. And so um, my dealings typically are with international students or students that are studying abroad, um, also in instruction of students at higher education level. So I've, I've listed here some of, uh, some of the points that I think have been uh, some of the greatest impacts of COVID-19 on education. And I think I can um, speak for everyone when I say we've used the word unprecedented more this last year than we probably ever have in our lives, right? Um, so this has really been a time of being nimble and adjusting to all of these changes and trying to make the best of, of um, what we have available to us. So um, one of the first things I thought of was, you know, the reduced instructional and learning time that students are having. Um, you know, class meetings may not be meeting uh, the, the full recommended credit hour per week because of the limitations to online learning. Um, in addition to the shutdowns, which initially were shut down for two weeks, so no learning was going on, um, there was, uh, you know, a gap in developing online courses on the fly. <clears throat> you know, some instructors did not have the, the training or the knowledge um, to, to, um, to create those courses. Um, in addition to just the shutdown itself, I think the U.S. has kind of been plagued with a number of natural disasters. I know in Pensacola in September, we experienced a hurricane, um, which kind of knocked us out for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, people didn't have power. Uh, we couldn't get, get to class. We couldn't turn on our computer to do online instruction. Um, but there's been a number of things like snowstorms and other um, issues all across the, the states that have been um, problematic in terms of access to online instruction. And of course, we can't forget the psychological impacts that Anna spoke of um, earlier. Um, you know, social and emotional interaction are an important part of education, especially for the K through 12 students. Um, although it might be secondary to the academic side, um, it's certainly a critical, critical skill that students are learning by being involved and in working uh, a, 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 with their peers. Um, and what I've seen too, with, um, in terms of the the knowledge of moving course platforms online, is that the 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 training has been more um, geared toward the instructor and less toward the student. And I think that you know um, maybe in our ignorance, we think that these millennials and these young students have all of the skills to go online and be able to um, 
to do this successfully, but there's still a gap in knowledge for students um, returning to online courses. Um, many of them who just are fearful of it in general, they don't like the discussion forums, they want the face-to-face -face interaction. And so I think we really need to do a better job in um, training our students as well as our faculty and instructors. Um, for, for my office in particular, the limitations to mobility have been um, very difficult because you know, I'm working with an international population who is unable to enter the United States due to um, visa, the visa offices, consular offices not giving visas right now or there being travel restrictions. Um, when this all hit last March, we had students that were abroad that we had to repatriate and bring back because they were studying abroad, some of who couldn't get back in because they were foreign nationals. Um, and this is still hitting us, I think, uh, a recent um, uh, some recent data came out from the Department of Homeland Security that said 72% enrollment was down with new international students by 72% in the U.S. Um, last fall. So this is a tremendous financial impact um, to a number of institutes of higher education as well. And I think as we m move on through this discussion, we'll also highlight some of the benefits and some of the things that we've learned, the lessons learned, and the things that we may want to continue to incorporate um, mm. as, as we move along. But um, I wanted to show this graphic that uh, gives you an idea of, you know, what states are open. And I think, you know, we are the United States of America, but we may not be united in our opinion of, you know, what should be open and what should not. And I think you can see here, Florida has had a very sort of lenient, um, relaxed response to COVID in general. Um, <clears throat> and even when this hit, students had, many students had the choice of doing um, fully face-to-face -face courses, a hybrid model where they could do some face-to-face, -face, some online, or fully online. It's kind of been up to the parents' discretion. Um, but for fall of 2021, um, there is a, a mandate to reopen all of the schools. And then finally, um, I've listed some resources here. Um, these are geared mainly toward higher ed, but all of them list um, ways in which you can assist your students and have better um, studying habits for students during this pandemic and how we can make the best of you know what we've been given. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Rachel. So we've got a, about 50 or so minutes to, to, to discuss it, basically. Lots of what, whatever you said in your presentation is actually quite a, a worrying uh, point to, to, to consider. Uh, psychological impact of lockdowns, what, what, really happen, what really happened or what is really happening to students <clears throat> when they are at home and are trying to, to battle with this new environment and new phenomenon? Uh, maybe let's start from Martin. He knows a lot about it. Uh, First-hand experience, I would say. Yes, yes, that's true. Thank you. Let me share a few thoughts. Well, I'm going to speak from this perspective of a father, mostly, but also a bit of a teacher, because, well, it's connected. Uh, there are many different aspects that should be taken into consideration. All the beginnings were quite difficult, mm -hmm. starting with the amount of equipment necessary at home, the quality of the internet connection, mm -hmm. which in some cases was quite easy to upgrade, but not in every household. It was the time devoted to children, that mm -hmm. children who required help, the know-how, how to use all the applications, how to help children. And of course, the biggest problem was with the first, the second, the third grade students, the youngest mm -hmm. kids. We're going to discuss this learning loss later on, but many people argue whether there is the learning loss, what is actually loss, or is it just the lack of learning? Well, this is, for me as a parent, it's just the semantics. It doesn't matter what you call it, but the problem exists. But there's a loss. Right? Yeah, the loss. And in case of those kids, what was really lost, and I know it from the experience, is a lot of different skills, literacy, the ability to write. They, they started their first year in September, then in March, they were locked at home. They lost some fluency. This is the age where it, Huge and you're you're quite special, yeah. Martin, because you're a parent and you're a teacher at the same time. Yes. And we've had this year, you know, like two, the last 12 months to actually sort it out 
do you have a feeling you could actually somehow square the circle and try to help your kids and, and, and perhaps by that experience other kids as well to, to make up for it, to somehow cope with the situation? Well, it's very difficult how to cope with the situation. But first, I believe we should start with helping the, the teachers. Mm -hmm. Those who are not prepared to deliver lessons, to deliver classes to those kids. Mm -hmm. Basically, those kids were not fluent enough to operate computers. They required assistance. There was a lot of stress when they couldn't connect with their teacher. At the same time, the technical problems were on daily basis. They happened every day. Those teachers who and you didn't have any you didn't have any help, did you? Well, I did at some point, but I tried to help teachers in my uh, children's school, mm -hmm. and we are constantly in contact. Okay. But you know, there are all the other teachers uh, around Poland who required that help. So the the success of our children depends really on this computer literacy of those teachers, of those skills. Mm -hmm. So we started with a lot of problems. Uh, they do teach some coding at this level. They have computer classes, but this is nothing compared to remote learning. They were can, I just, can, I just, can I just pop in for a second and, and ask our American friends, how long were you locked up or how many? We had three, time, you know, there's like three major lockdowns. We, we were in one of them now. How long were you sort of uh, out of the, anybody? Well, um, I think, I can't remember the exact date, but it was sometime in the mm -hmm. summer, I believe, was that right, Gina? Mm -hmm. That we, the state of Florida went on a lockdown and I think it was about a month, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a full lockdown. Mm -hmm. So there were, right. um, you know, uh, restaurants could operate at mm -hmm. a certain capacity, grocery stores, um, you know, there mm -hmm. were a number of service sort of uh, businesses that were on full lockdown, but you still saw people walking around in the streets. But, you know, during September, I was in Boston and it was a completely different experience mm -hmm. in a different state. Um, everyone was wearing masks, even on the streets. So, um, again, right. so we are in that way, we're different because we, we, we are, our rules are universal all across mm -hmm. uh, our country, all across Poland. And it's different in different states in the United States. Are Correct. Right, I, I imagine. All right, sorry, Thanks. sorry, Martin, for that interruption. Okay, no problem. So we started with, we parents started with getting a lot of exercises, homework, usually via email. So we had to work with mm -hmm. our children. Mm -hmm. Basically, we were supposed to teach them. It has some positive aspects too, because some of uh, the parents realized how difficult it was to teach their own kids, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it required a lot of time. I'll give you an example I read uh, recently. There's this uh, computer programmer who is well, quite uh, okay working from home, but his son is a first grade student. So he mm -hmm. has classes every day. Usually the lesson lasts about 20 minutes, which is okay for small children, but then he has like 20, 25, 30 minutes of a break when the child is quite bored. So the, the, obviously the son interrupts with his work. So he and other parents organized and they deliver four or five children to one of the homes and they swap uh, each day it, it's mm, different wow. uh, parents so in this way they can work properly four days a week and during the day when they do have children at home the kids can play with each other that, that's obvious yes so it's a win-win situation but there's many different uh, parents like those called helicopter parents who are always at home always there for for their children they not only listen to all of the lessons but in the worst case scenario they interrupt lessons they undermine the teacher and well this is where the problems start if you have a problem with the teacher then there are some other ways of you know communicating with schools with the principal etc etc not during the right. lessons yep how okay. is the teacher supposed to maintain his authority, the respect? Okay, before uh, Martin, before mm -hmm. we go into teachers, okay. let's just concentrate a bit, just for a few more minutes on, on, on the students. I mean, what is their mental state now? I don't know whether you can tell a difference between what's happening in Poland and what's happening in the United States, but the numbers, the statistics, uh, 
from my country, from Poland, is really, really alarming. What about the United States? What is the mental condition of... Maybe Catherine, what, what do you think? Do you have any uh, data on that or do, do you know anything about that particular aspect? I don't know any data, but I can certainly speak yeah. to yeah. my experience and that of my friends. Um, we all finished our final year of high school and moved on to college over this past year. Mm -hmm. And that has honestly proved to be a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Most of us have experienced quite a bit of isolation. Um, mm -hmm. I know that I personally am still largely in a group with my old high school friends, whereas normally mm -hmm. I would have developed quite a number of friends at my university, mm -hmm. which considering I'm not in the same state has yeah. not exactly happened. Yeah. So it's certainly proved to be a challenge in terms of connection and um, even talking with teachers, some friends of various colleges mm -hmm. where they are much more hands off. Um, and I'm very fortunate in that at my college, we all already have quite a bit of hands-on experience with yeah, our yeah. teachers, individual meetings, which has helped me greatly from what I've heard. All right, ladies and gentlemen, is there any idea, is there any idea in your head and perhaps in your thinking, how can we handle that crisis in the mental state of uh, thousands, if not millions of youngsters, young people, uh, pupils, how to even start addressing this problem anybody well i can I, again i can speak for my institution and um no. or some speaking of data <clears throat> some of the recent um surveys i think it was about 150 students were or 150 institutions were surveyed and they showed a 39 percent increase in anxiety issues across mm -hmm. campuses uh, across the u.s um so that's huge right i mean it's nearly absolutely simple, absolutely right? so, um I think that one of the things that um, many psychological services have been doing, especially on campuses, is offering um, uh, offering um, a way for students to seek services in mm -hmm. an online format. So again, you know, the, their their hands are kind of tied in doing um, these online sessions, but these sessions are geared more toward um, depression and anxiety issues, which are where we're really seeing most of the psychological issues. Um, anecdotally, I can say that mm -hmm. our, um, our wait times to see a counselor here on campus is like two to three weeks, which is unheard mm -hmm. of. Um, and so apart from that, I think, you know, a lot of our student organizations, a lot of our community organizations are trying to reach out to students to um, to rid them of that feeling of isolation. Um, but unfortunately, it exists in a format much like this. Um, uh, the state of Florida has recently opened up uh, where we can have group meetings. I think it's it was 10, a group of 10. Mm -hmm. Now it's up to 25 or we'll be up to 25. So just for instance, last week, our institution held a big comedy fest because everyone that's watching right, right now. Online, um, online or not? It was outdoors. Um, it was outdoors. In a big, like, uh, you know, a, a baseball field. Um, oh. And they practiced social distancing. We had masks. We had people out there monitoring them. Um, you know, they got the opportunity to laugh at some jokes. But Florida, is, Florida is, is quite liberal about these restrictions, as we've heard. Yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we tend not to be at the moment. Here, what you're talking okay, and what I about the say people? That most of the country is divided on whether or not our governor's response of course, was appropriate. Of course, of course. Of course, of course. Our society is divided as well. It's just that we're not divided state-wise. We, obviously, we're we're a smaller country. What, what, what about the Polish? Uh, what about the Polish side? I mean, any idea for how to systematically address this issue, which has grown to be a real, uh, a big problem for for the school and for the parents and for the students as well, or pupils. I don't. Uh, I don't have the answer how to cure the situation, but I think that it will. It will something very deep for this generation. Mm -hmm. This experience will be very deep. I would like to comment on what Catherine said because it was so much uh, important that we have a whole like a year of, of of teenagers of young people who uh, are losing more than a half of high school, who had no uh, possibility to meet new colleagues, new friends from mm. school. Uh, one person that I talked um, with uh, recently said, okay, I, I, I'm in a high school already for, th for two years, but I almost know nobody. And also what they stress is that they lose some very important dates for them, like the mm. part 
to have when you turn 18 in Poland. It's something very important. And there is... Uh, Anna, what, kind of what kind of consequences do you think it might have on the future of those, of those children? You might as well say it's just about a year. They've got lots of years in front of them. They can, you know, make up for it. That's why I, I try to um, search for something positive. I, I think it will be some kind of experience that will join them, uh, that maybe they will um, they will be able to um, to see the joy of the normal life. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will see the joy to be offline, probably, because before we were talking so much about how to bring kids offline because they're all the, all the time online. And now they by themselves, they stress, I want to be offline. Of course, they're like I show uh, on my on my slides. They are addicted. We see the, this problem, but also they have a very strong emotion to go offline, to go to people, to move uh, into the real relations. So maybe it will be a kind of you know the um, the wake up for them how to appreciate normal life, not only in front of the screen. All right, you have just started the the second point. The second point that we would like to dwell on today, and it's about uh, the online well being. So basically. How do we take care uh, of our well-being when we are online? It's a new ability. It's a new skill that we have to develop. It's something that we didn't really have to care so much about before the pandemic. But now it's just, it's a necessity. How, how to do that? Well, I can tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the Youth mm -hmm. Diplomats program in Pensacola. Yeah. So I'm not a teacher. Um, I run mm -hmm. a nonprofit, but we also have a program. It's a monthly program for teenagers. Uh, they get together. They used to get together in person to discuss global issues and leadership matters. And now, since March 2020, we pivoted, pivoted, pivoted and went online. Um, something that I noticed pretty much right away was that we were going to have to adjust what we were doing. So in person, we meet for five hours, one Saturday a month. Mm -hmm. And after two of our Saturday meetings, um, I was I was drained. So I knew that the students we that is, had to be Jenna, trained. We, well. that is who? we that is who? Who's meeting? Um, so it's 24 high mm -hmm. school students and then okay. two adults. All right. And um, so what we had to do was start incorporating sufficient breaks mm -hmm. and also so to focus on some embodiment practices. So when we're having longer sessions, like this summer we had a camp that was several days long, we would have mm -hmm. to take those that, that time to encourage the students to stop, look across the room, find a corner and look at it for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I read no, somewhere, I yeah, so I read somewhere recently that so for every 20 minutes that you're staring at the screen, you should take 20 seconds to look 20 feet away. I don't know how many mm -hmm. meters that is, sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to have that break. So forget then, about the 45 minute long lessons. I'm sorry? Forget about 45 minute long lessons online. Right. So you have to have breaks and you have to have encourage students to get up and get their jiggles out and just do some mm -hmm. kind of movement. Um, but one thing that we're looking forward to doing as soon as as soon as we're able. So as as Rachel mentioned, we had a hurricane and it broke a bridge that connects our two com the our community and the community next door. And our students mm -hmm. are in both communities. As soon as that bridge is repaired and we can get back together in person, mm -hmm. um, we're looking to incorporate some outdoor activities, some volunteer yeah. activities where they can be socially distanced and to get have some time in nature because I think that time spent in nature will help balance all of the technology that we're experiencing right now. And I think that has to have some mental health benefits as well. All right, thank you. Maybe a Polish perspective, maybe even teacher's perspective from, from Poland. Łukasz? Yeah, I can say something about that. Thank you. Uh, you know, in, in my case, I love to uh, coming back to school. As you see, I'm in the um, in the back side. You will see my class, mm -hmm. and some of the students from my school, because I'm teaching in the high school, uh, are have a exam at the end of the of the semester of this of, of this mm -hmm. school year, and they need to came to school to make some practice. And I see that. Um, those um, abilities, not abilities, those um, well-being or 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 um, or um, 
I don't know. I see that, that they are smiling. They they are uh, working well. They have joy to 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 um, to be with friends and to be with me. To to go out from from uh, from own home. And that that was said uh, Anna before that um, they can have joy to be online offline. Yeah, so. uh, Lukasz, how did it how did it change your perspective as a teacher? to the teaching and learning process. How did it change you? What kind of different tools are you using? What kind of different techniques are you trying to incorporate? Or are you still in in this uh, uh, moment of uncertainty, uh, not really knowing w which would be the best way to go? No, no, my, my lessons, it's like uh, online lessons always turn around um, uh, in, in comparing to, to, to typical ones. So, um, for example, if you are checking the list of the students you need to do at the end of the lesson not in the front of so yeah so m m many of uh, our teachers don't understand how it work and and how we can organize our our lesson plans for example so mm -hmm. it, it, it'd be tricky or it'd be um, something something different between mm -hmm. but um, in my case i don't have a problem with that i'm, I'm like a, I'm, I'm an ict teacher so I'm, i often make some uh, plenty of the hours in the front of the monitor. All right, can you just give us three simple examples of what changes did you introduce to your teaching after COVID? Okay, so it was like uh, using ICT tools, for example, uh, during COVID. D during my lessons, I need to I need to move my lesson plan to online plan and, mm -hmm. and find a tool to to connect with teacher. The safety tool, I mean, like that because. One of our topics is like a cyber security. We need to find the tool who, um, which is a correct or, or, or fit to our uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. For example, Discord, many of the Polish students at uh, Polish teacher try to connect with the Discord. It's not, not like a typical teacher's tool. I recommend Teams or even Zoom. Even Zoom, it's not like a, not not not, not like right. the one because it was like a Zoom link. Anna, Anna told us before about about the, the, this question. So, okay. so, so with the choice. All right. So, thing number one is the choice of a tool. That's right. Yeah, what the, the, what the, the the second one is to move some kind of not feeling some some kind of things that we used to it in manual lesson to online lesson. For example. The, the 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 raising hand tool in teams mm -hmm. so i don't see my students who want to do it i, I made some uh, some silly um, voting for example who of you uh, doesn't agree that, that the number of the or the mm -hmm. uh, it, the, uh, the number of of this uh, not not teacher sorry i forget the word in english what i'm saying about, Polish, i'll help you yeah it's, um, Rozwiązanie. Rozwiązanie jest 24. Solution. 24. Solution. solution, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the solution will be 24 on 26. Who is okay. agreed? So we can use the race tool. We have many tools. Right. So some, some, some kind mm -hmm. of interface between a real physical interaction and an online expression. Okay, that's number two, thing number two. And thing number three. Thing number three, uh, you know, it's like uh, well-being. We need, we need to... We need to um, know that uh, the lesson online should be much more shorter than the lesson uh, um, comparing to, to the manual lesson, to the typical one, you know, because they are teaching, they are, yes, they are uh, learning. Jana has they are, mentioned that. What, what, yeah, how long will that be? 20 minutes or what? Yep. In my case, it's around 25 okay. to 30 minutes. <clears throat> I think right. it's longer it's, than that. Because they are they are they are learning in the front of the computer. They are making homework of in the course. front of the computer. They have a, a some kind of uh, I don't know games or free time. I don't know. Twelve in, in some cases, twelve hours in front of a computer. That's a bit too much. All right. Yeah. Any other ideas that we can share about how to translate online well online well being uh, in in this in these uh, difficult times? Any other ideas? Just to compliment. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it's up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the regulations are up to individual schools in Poland. So only recently, my daughter's high school uh, reduced <coughs> the number of minutes of certain lessons. They've got like 45 minutes of Polish, English, mathematics, uh, physical education is shorter, art is shorter, but it depends on, on which uh, class you are in. Uh, all right. Okay. Also, uh, 
your well-being, the student's well-being, depends on the use of microphones and cameras. If In what can, way? Uh, well, if you can turn off your camera, then you can move around your room. If, uh, if you have some room, you can, you know, stand up, stretch your legs, you can lie down, you can mm -hmm. close your eyes. Uh, if you can turn off your microphone. Well, okay. In other words, it's good for the teacher to allow students or pupils to turn off their cameras and but yes. then this is, the, the, yeah, well, but there's an aspect of control in some sort. Uh, students but can this control. is another big issue. <laughs> this is like the renaissance of camera because <laughs> our system is exam oriented. You know, there's always an exam ahead of you in Poland, right? Mm -hmm. And now look sad there are exams where people where students have to come to school to attend and this yeah. is great but some of the exams are taken online well and the teachers are going into extremes with the cameras like you are allowed to look at the ceiling you cannot look <laughs> down because you might be reading some notes yeah and yeah, these are the real examples from our life well and because some students understand that the exams are not particularly important in their professional development. This is just for numbers, right? Mm -hmm. To get into university, but it's not really helpful in their real life. Mm -hmm. They sometimes do cheat. Well, but the paradox is that in order to cheat, they have mm -hmm. to cooperate, they have to talk to friends, they have to prepare, they have to search, for certain information. All right, so you, what you're saying is that cheating is a very efficient educational tool. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's more helpful in the future <laughs> career than just learning loads very, of data. Very original. Many yeah. educators understand or, or have seen cases of students who learned quite a lot, did well at school, but were not successful in future lives. Those, right. yeah, those who try to cheat, they assess the quality of information. They learn by themselves critical thinking, which might be very important in future. Okay, what well, a question to our, to our American friends. Do you have the feeling that it's going the right way? Or what do you think about this idea? Perhaps it's a, it's a new look at things and it's not, well, critically thinking, perhaps it's, 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 it's a good idea. I don't know, what do you think? Well, um, I'm I'm not going to be in the pro cheating camp here, but um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I did want to ask I did want to ask Catherine something very quickly because yeah. talking about how you know the changes in the classroom. I'm wondering, Catherine, if last year when you were in high school, did your teachers incorporate Kahoot at all into the platform? Because we've used Kahoot in Youth Diplomats and found that 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 mm -hmm. gamification, you know, that that little bit of fun adds a social element that we didn't have before, and it's really needed. All right. For me, Kahoot had been used quite frequently prior to the pandemic. Um, we didn't end up using it a ton during the last couple months of high school, but that is absolutely something that I would advocate for. Having any sort of built-in social interactions amongst the students, which can be difficult to integrate into the classroom, but it's still incredibly important right now more so than ever. And that is an excellent way of having both a little fun and mm -hmm. testing students, seeing how they're doing and seeing where they need to improve. Whatever you're s s s saying or describing the new t t tools and techniques, do you think they are just a temporary way to deal with the problems? Or are they a part of a, a stable solution for the future? Well, in our case, when we're allowed to go back in in person, we will, but we won't do it until 2022 because mm -hmm. I made a commitment to some of the students in our program who are calling in from overseas to be part of our mm -hmm. uh, youth youth education program that will be online. But definitely, once we go, once we're able to go in person, we're definitely mm -hmm. not getting rid of what we've learned. And I think mm -hmm. that we'll either have we'll have some kind of hybrid program so that we can um, bring in students from areas mm -hmm. of the United States and areas of the world that we weren't able to reach otherwise. But are we going are, are we just in front of a necessity to completely change the methodology of teaching in the future? Uh, Bokash is nodding. 
Yeah, in, in my opinion, this is the, the, the right place and time to change our way of teaching because a lot of skills that we have earned, I mean, like digital skills, most of the teachers need to move uh, from their own comfort zones and, and try to do something more or try to make uh, the, the lessons more attractive. And this is the time and place, in my opinion, that we should say stop and, and do something um, from the new beginning. Uh, if I could add something to what Łukasz said, uh, basing on the research, on the reports that we have in Poland, over 40%, if I remember correctly, 40% of teachers is open to go to the hybrid um, learning. So they would really like uh, still to use those technologies, those techniques that they learned in the in the past months, and I think it's uh, it's very optimistic. Of course, the majority would like to go offline and to go to the normal school, but still keep the competences they reached uh, in last months. Uh, and if I can add uh, also one one um, uh, short thing. Uh, yep. I think it's, uh, it's also crucial when we talk about those cameras, microphones used during remote lessons, it's crucial to have a consent. Uh, when we speak to teachers and to young people, they need a com common consent. Uh, the teacher must explain why it's important for her, him to, to see pupils. And mm. if about us adults, it's so nicer to talk when I see you now. <laughs> I can feel your emotions. I can see if my information reached you. And if I cannot see you, I don't know if I'm talking like only to the screen, I cannot see people and I cannot build relations also with pupils. So I think it's very important to teachers to really articulate their needs to say, I want to see you because I want to feel right. the connection with you, sure. yeah. to work on our relations. And then uh, children are more likely to be open and to, uh, to put the camera on. And it's yep. not that when you have a camera on, you cannot move in your room. You can move, but still be present and be able to share emotions. Uh, sure, with sure, of course. Uh, can I just ask, sorry for asking this very specific question, but do you have any idea how to handle a situation in which you have to share a room with either your parents or your uh, brother or sister, your siblings, basically, or somebody else, or else you have to share your computer? These are very uh, down-to-earth things, but they are real problems for many people. I'll tell you, if you have to share a room with your dog, you're going to wear headphones <laughs> like I have, because if she starts barking, I don't want everyone to hear it. <laughs> right, you can't do that with cats, because cats usually just uh, walk in front of your, your camera. All right. OK, I don't have a cat. But one of my friends, who is also a teacher, uh, she has to work in the kitchen, right? Because this mm -hmm. is the room that she occupies. So she runs her lessons from the kitchen and then her daughter cannot come down to have a meal because she would interrupt her. You know, they have breaks at different times. So this is the problem, but not working in the same room. No, I, 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 I haven't heard of that case, but it must right. be a serious problem, yeah. I think it's a very important question. I mean, one of the crucial questions because we, we, we can't talk about the consequences of the pandemic uh, separately from um, economic status and social conditions of living because there are people having a huge houses with uh, uh, two devices per person and uh, each room for everyone. And there are people living, five people in, in 30 meters square. So I think it's absolutely crucial part and talking about the well-being of kids, we have to remember about those differences. In yeah. Poland, it's very, very big. All right, okay. Are they, uh, but there, in some parts of the United States, they are also quite quite big. And I remember this being uh, a problem in the United States from the, from the, from the past debate. Well, I can tell you that a colleague of mine um, was having trouble signing in and having a stable internet. And it turned out, we asked him to run a, a, a check on his system and mm -hmm. it turned out it was his problems were when his roommates were home and they were gaming. And so Love he it. had to work out a schedule with them so that uh, during his work time, they weren't gaming. And then after that, they could just have the run of the show. Right. Okay. One of right. the things we've also done is, uh, you know, some students, we're not in the poorest county in the state of Florida, but nearly 70% of our students are on some sort of need, um, 
evidence-based aid. So many of our students don't have access to laptops. They don't have their impersonal laptops or internet uh, service at home. And so what we did was open up different rooms because we're, our campus is pretty much closed at this point, um, opened up offices, rooms in the library where students could practice social distancing but have access to the technology. Um, yep. So even if they weren't able to have you know, the privacy um, in a shared residence hall or dorm or uh, at their home, they would have some place to go to um, access their online courses. All right, let's talk about... You can say something. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Well, gosh, about, yeah. about cameras. You know, in, in my case, uh, many of my teachers' friends are knowing that a uh, student doesn't want to show or turn on the video. And um, in Poland, we don't have a, some kind of regulation that you need to do that because you are at the lesson. But, but you know, I think that, that most, um, many of the teachers forget about to explain like Anna do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just, I want to see you, I want to connect with you, I want to feel that you are the part of my classroom. Please turn on your camera. Most of the most of our tools like Teams or, or Zoom or other um, application to, to, to connect with your, with your students have a, that, that kind of function that you can have, for example, a green screen for your own without the green screen plate. Just just put your picture or, or background, and, and you don't need to show other things that you have. And uh, like like um, the, the using the, the headphones or um, different microphone can can be a solution with that. Sure. All right. Thanks very much. Let's have a look at a, a larger landscape uh, now. Is there any support, or is it good enough? I'm speaking about support for teachers in that. Uh, in that particular time. What kind of support do we have in Poland or do we, or what kind of support do you have in the United States? What what kind of different perspective do we have on that? Well, I think in the US we've relied heavily on our information technology offices, probably more so than we have in the past um, mm -hmm. for training because uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, teachers had to quickly create a platform if, if you know, uh, the framework for an online course wasn't built. They had, mm -hmm. you know, a matter of a couple of weeks to do so. So we implemented a number of trainings specific to faculty. Um, I mean, getting back to Martin's point about academic integrity, we, of mm -hmm. course, there's an increase in student conduct issues, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's also important that we have clear expectations of, you know, mm -hmm. of what is required of a student. And um, so in terms of support, one of the things that we ins instituted was um, a, a service called um, Lockdown Respondus. And so mm -hmm. it will lock down your um, computer's browser. You have to take your quiz or test through, through this browser. Mm -hmm. It locks down everything so a student doesn't have access to Google while they're taking a test. Um, so there's, you know, all of these services that we didn't even know existed, things like Wander, mm -hmm. where um, you can kind of create a platform, create an avatar. Could, could, could you say the name of that service again? What is it uh, called? The, the one that locks down your browser is called Respondus. The other okay. one is called Wander, W-A-N-D-E-R. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a service that acts almost like, um, like if you were at a conference, it creates tables and you have an avatar where you can go and talk to other people in different rooms. Um, and so it kind of gives you the the feel of being in a face-to-face -face experience sure, sure, without, sure, sure. without. So it's a kind of technological support, right? technological support, but I also had in mind a sort of mental, uh, perhaps for the teachers, methodological support, mm -hmm. some kind of, you know, assistance. Yeah, we're in difficult times, but we've got a group of people or an agency or whatever institution that can give you a helping hand if you're in, in, in trouble, in crisis, if you don't, want to, don't know what to do. But uh, do, do we have anything like that in, in Poland by any chance? Uh, I, 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 <laughs> oh, sorry, Martin. Okay. No, no, no. I was just, I thought that nobody wanted to share this information with us. So clearly, there's a need for this, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> there's a need for it, yes. There's a sort of a, a, a massive silence after this question. So what kind of support would you expect? What, what kind of support would you need? You know, Martin, in, 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 Martin you, you don't have a, you have muted microphone. Unmute microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I did notice you were speaking yeah. here. We didn't hear oh, about sorry. it. You I just said the again. silence was meaningful. I'm sure you said okay. something very important. It's just a start over again. <laughs> no, but I don't have that much experience uh, 
from school at the moment, so I don't mm -hmm. know if the teachers were offered. Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, if yes, then the help was in terms of, I don't know, technology. If uh, some platforms were introduced to schools, then some trainings were, were delivered too, but not psycho psychological, mostly technical. What about methodological assistance? Not so much. Ukash, was there anything at school? I don't believe so. You know, I think that uh, it was it's the situation. It's new not only for Polish teacher or Polish government for all of the world, and and I think that um, there is no good solution for that. At the last March um, in 2020, it was like. Uh, sometimes some decision of our politicians or our ministry of ours or my decision my, my headmaster etc was something like the gorilla in the fog so so you know it was like a, what we should do what we should take or, or how, how it how it should work and and um, that for first the, for, for second uh, i think that many of um many of politicians forget about teachers about mental health about as, as Martin said before, we have only the exams. We have testing, testing. Te we have tests, and, and, and we make some exams. And and we sometimes we totally forgot about about people, about feelings, about well-being. And I think that uh, um, does, does the pandemic make it worse? Uh, you know, in my opinion, no. I, I don't think it, it's like in, in, at the same level. But now it's better because right now we are one. We have um, one year of the lockdown, mm. around, for example, two months, plus minus. And, and you know, and, and right now, many of the associations or many of the of the people uh, try to find the solution how to help. And I think that that, that kind of solution will stay. Much more longer than pandemic and, and, and the yeah. things that we have right now. Sure. sure. Yeah, How teachers, you, teachers yeah. are looking for help, but on their own, right? All right. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you know what would be helpful is more guidance on work-life balance because many of us are working some doing at home work or um, and also parenting. Um, so they might have children at home instead of going to school and trying to balance all of these things, you know, doing calls in between, you know, trying to feed your child, like Amy was doing earlier. So of I think that there needs to be more um, guidance and assistance. Yeah. Where, where could that advice come from? Where could that, gui could that guidance come from? Where would you expect it to come from, basically? Would that be an NGO sector? Would that be a, an academic sector or a government or federal government or... Where would you look at? I don't know. Here on campus, we have uh, an employee benefit. It's part of our insurance that provides these kinds of services. And I have I have taken some of the courses, but to be honest, you know, it was kind of a you know a top ten list of things you should do. It wasn't really practical advice. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think we're all just trying to navigate this on our own. And whether we're doing it right or not, it's almost like. Um, you know the, the the movie Groundhog Day. Every day is just starting right. over again, um, and you're kind of at the end of the day. I usually go, I made it another day," um, <laughs> and I think everyone's cool. everyone's path in this is different. Um, depending yeah, but on it seems life. in that particular aspect, we are on the same boat in a way. I mean, everyone is trying to play this game individually, basically on the, on their own. Um. If I could add something um, uh, from uh, from conversations that we have with teachers, they appreciate a lot all like, especially at the beginning, they appreciated a lot all those ready to use, for example, lessons, uh, mostly lessons from our side, like uh, from NASC side, uh, lessons about the internet safety that they could use, but all lessons from all different topics. Uh, we have a project, um, it is called uh, OSIT Szkoła, which is based in, um, a national educational um, network. It's a project that NASC operates. It's it's a governmental project, and within mm -hmm. this, we also tried to deliver most of resources that we could. I know that a lots of also technology was delivered in um, in following months of pandemic. Mm -hmm. Of course, 
very beginning, teachers felt very alone. We know from the reports that they used, um, like 90% of them use their own um, tools, their own laptops, um, their own internet connection. I think in months, in months it changed. And I know that teachers really appreciated all the resources that were produced by very, very different um, institutions, non-governmental mm -hmm. NGOs, like also governmental institutions. Yeah. So I think it was like a huge, huge work done by many different sectors to give teachers a help, but also to give parents a help. Because like you said, Rachel, yeah, you that's another said story. it's a combination of parental and, um, and remote work. Uh, we all um, deal with this. So we all need help, actually. All right. Anyone would like to add anything about this particular? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. because you mentioned Kahoot. We teach as an association different solutions. We use clickers, we use quizzes, and all these gamification methods where you implement competition, rivalry into education, which motivates students. They somehow feel like you know having fun playing but learning at the same time. Uh, and implementing all those active methods, this should be new quality in our Polish education in the times post-COVID. All right. And I was going to say that, and I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look it up on Twitter without looking like I'm on my phone, uh, <laughs> but there are a couple of really good uh, groups on Twitter or, or Well, you Virtual. pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Okay, back with us. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened there. Um, so, uh, uh, vir teachers who have been working in the virtual sphere for several years, and I've been um, learning from them, looking at what they are posting, suggestions that they have out there. And so, um, on Twitter, if you can just look around it, maybe search for virtual, you'll find some resources there as well. All right. So that's it about this uh, particular uh, point on our, uh, on our script. Now, uh, a qu quite a controversial thing, but also an interesting insight into how things looked, uh, have looked over the last uh, 12 months or so. Has, do you think, has any, uh, anybody or anyone uh, gained anything on COVID, in fact? Uh, I know that Wukash has a lot to say about that. He's got a lot of experience on that particular uh, on that particular aspect. So, Wukash, could you please enlighten us a bit on this particular aspect of COVID? So, who did the best? Or who actually um, used it for for the betterment of their career or, or education? Yeah, you know, I think that it's the good time and place to say something positive. In our debate. <laughs> you know, we are always. Say, uh, say only the, the minus. So the, yeah, let's be on the bright side now. Yeah, on the bright side. Okay, in my opinion, COVID, um, COVID situation help or even force, I can say, mm -hmm. a teacher to leave the comfort, own comfort zones. You know, it was, I know that it was difficult to adapt or, um, or to make our lessons online, our curriculum online but um, it was all, also very big, big advent, uh, advantages to, to change our curriculum and to customize our lesson but you know the digital skills that uh, we earn will stay with us forever after the covid and i think that many of the tools can we we can use uh, after that, you, you you meant like Kahoot, or you I used all the time Mentimet for whiteboard data fee, or or some other tools. And um, one of many of my teachers' friends doesn't know some kind of tools. And after pandemic, they learn about it, and okay, it's quite good. I can mm -hmm. uh, I, I can use it all the time, even if we came back to school. And I think that most of us want to come back to school I, 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 in my case i'm just calculating the days where, where the, the, the time will came but but you know uh some some of us doesn't uh think about it how it be looks like so if you of, of how example, different it will be yeah yeah of course if you collect the notes to your own home or to your to your um, uh, on, on your desk do you do the same or after after the uh, after you came after COVID after pandemic 
Probably no. For example, if you're walking around in, the, in your classroom, you do the same after mm -hmm. pandemic? I think no. So the Teams solution, like OneNote in Teams or digital tools, can help us to to turn around our education system. And I think that um, we can say stop and, and 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 start from the very new beginning to new way of teaching. All right, Catherine. How do you think your educational process, your, your university education, will change because of COVID? Well, one benefit from COVID that we've seen is a drastic increase in the accessibility. Mm -hmm. I know a number of students that have had lifelong dreams of living in Hawaii or Boston and yep. have taken a semester to live there while doing virtual school. Um, others have had different internship and job opportunities. I know that I wouldn't be able to be doing this particular <laughs> internship with Gulf Coast Diplomacy without the pandemic. Um, so I think that uh, my college may actually be planning on having some sort of more flexible options for students to be able to study abroad and take different jobs and not be as physically tied down to campus as we were before. Are you looking forward to these changes or are you a bit afraid? It's definitely nerve wracking. Absolutely. I, on the one hand, um, we have so much more. On the other hand, wow, we have a lot more to deal with. <laughs> um, but I think that at the end of the day, it's very exciting to be able to have all of these new opportunities. All right, thank you very much. Anybody would like to add anything to it? Which, uh, in well, uh, in particular, the American, because uh, Wukas said about the Polish side, what about the American side in terms of teachers? Uh, what good will stay after uh, the pandemic for the teachers? Yeah, I kind of <clears throat> second what Catherine is saying in terms of accessibility. I think <clears throat> that the state of education is probably going to be very different, um, at least for the next five to 10 years. I think uh, schools that were able to transition quickly are going to be okay. I mean, there's been a number of schools who haven't been able to survive the pandemic. Um, and, you know, students are anxious to get back to the class, the majority of students. Mm -hmm. but for a number of students, this works better for them. And I mean, online classes have always existed, but um, not at the scale. But students who have um, issues on the spectrum, like autism, students who have attention deficit disorder, who can't just physically yep. sit in a class for one hour or two hours, um, have, have shown, you know, uh, 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 that they've succeeded more in this online environment. So I think combining some of these things that we've learned with a face-to-face -face environment will probably be seen for the next several years. All right. Okay, I want to ask you something, sorry. Yeah, sure, of course. And then, no, no, question from Wukash and then Jenna. Okay, Wukash. Okay. Uh, question to all of you. Uh, do you think that people will appreciate the online stuff like webinars, live streams, or something else? Because during the pandemic, we are used to it, to something like that. And we say, OK, it's quite good. Uh, we don't need to um, move to the, for example, to other city to, to do something uh, like a trainings or invite the trainer to your school or other teacher. We have it online. And before the pandemic, I, I think that it was like not, not so popular. I don't know what, what is the, 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 the United States case uh, cases, but, but it's like a um, question to all of you. Well, um, I just finished a week long, uh, well, actually all three of us just finished a week long conference um, from home and we attended a conference in Washington, DC. It's a conference that I'm used to going to every year. Um, so having it online this year actually made me a little bit sad because I knew all of the things that I was missing. However, back in September, I attended from my home, I attended uh, a conference in London about virtual education. And that was amazing uh, because I would never have been able to get my office to pay for me to go to London to take the classes that I was able to do. So I think it's going to be a balance. But you lost, you said, 
that I knew what I was actually losing at some point, especially when it came. Right. So that takes me to a, that takes us to another another question. I'm sorry, Wukash, to sort of go back from the brighter side. But then again, I have to ask a negative question. Is there something like um, educational lo learning loss, educational loss? Uh, is there anything is a true me? Is there a true meaning behind this term? Um, if, if I may, again, we're not in the classroom. We're a, we're a group that meets monthly. Um, but for my group, it's been a gain. And I'm not going to say that we've lost oh, yeah. because what we've done is we've taken the opportunity to expose these youth to people who they never would have been able to meet otherwise. So we have speakers come in from Iceland, speakers come in from Kenya. And that's that is not their their normal world. So for us, it's been a plus. And I think Yes, we're all missing things. Like last year, we did a virtual party for Catherine's class when they graduated from high school. But as part of that class, we also traveled to Bolivia and got to go to a llama farm. Um, so it's different. And I, I think my hope is that the resiliency will shine through from all of this. Right. OK. Anyway, Anna, what did you think? Is there anything like a, a learning loss? Uh, I would like to add something to what um, Jenna said, because I think we will have to go hybrid. Because Lucas, it was a great question, because, for example, let's compare indicators. Like we used to do a conference locally in some parts of Poland and we could get, let's say, 150 people, 200 people in a room because the room was not that big to have more than 200 people. And also it was not so easy to get regionally more than 200 people. and now we do same conference of course not same but similar conference and we get almost 1000 people for uh, one hour and a half so actually now we if we talk about efficiency of our work we would say wow it's really fantastic <laughs> like our indicators show but on the other hand i think people are really really um um stressed and tired with all those webinars and conferences so it, it is very possible that in the following months it will not be so much attended that it used to be in 2020 and beginning of 2021 yeah. uh, so talking about what we uh, what we get and what we do <laughs> i started i started with this really dark side <laughs> and i think we lose a lot and i think we will have real problems in coming um, uh, from this isolation especially young people we see that um, cyber threats are really um, uh, more and more um, now we see also the security threats are rising like phishing for example and phishing is also very bad for kids for young people who are buying things online so we see all those bad, bad things related to our being all the time online. But I would like, because we are like 10 minutes, yes, before we end, I would like to add something good, because talking about about parents, because Wukash was saying about um, teachers and this good thing that we lost from the teacher's side, but I would like to, to focus on the parental side. Like talking to parents, we know that they learned what kids really do online. Of course, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, before we could ask parents, okay, what your child is doing online? And the answer was, is surfing, you know, is scrolling the net. And now I can I can hear from parents that the child is uh, is playing online games, is communicating on chat, uh, is watching uh, TV, is watching uh, I don't know Netflix or something. So like the the knowledge of parents about what kids really do online. And the knowledge of parents that kids really move their social life online, that they don't necessarily kill time online, but they move their social life, their relations, and they develop also online. I think it will be one of the most, the biggest chances after a pandemic for me from this family point of view. All right. Anybody else? Well, you know that uh, after th these debates are over, we're going to prepare a report summing up the conclusions and, and perhaps your um, suggestions. So let's spend the last five, six minutes of, of this meeting uh, just shuffling over the conclusions that you, you might want to include in this report. So uh, let's conclude so many uh, points that we have already discussed. What would you like uh, to see in that report uh, from 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 today's meeting, what are, what would be your most important message to uh, to go into that report? 
So just a free um, final conclusions now before we close before we close the meeting from from anybody who wants to say something. Well, if the teachers seek help, well, it is to be found. There are mm -hmm. NGOs like ours who deliver trainings. You just have to find it, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot to learn. There is new approaches. They have already learned quite a lot in terms of technology. Uh, they have developed certain skills. They've learned some things about uh, methodology. We mustn't forget that the research says that about 25% of students, or 20 perhaps, are quite happy with remote learning and not having to go to school. One of the students said, wow, at 1 p.m. I'm already at home uh, in my bed and I've just had dinner. I don't lose time. Okay, so I like the idea. Not everyone is so happy that they have to go to school. Some of them have to commute for a long time. Some have, you know, social anxiety. They, mm -hmm. they, they like it the way it is. Uh, they have more time to prepare for these Polish exams, right? Which are important, right, to get to, to the next school. So uh, there are also positive sides, yes. All right. Any other conclusions or messages from, from today that you would like to leave and speak out clearly in that report? And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we need to find some balance between the online and the offline life and in education in typical our, our jobs because not of all of us are educators and I think that the, the life balance between offline and online is the most important thing that we need to uh, remember. That's that's my conclusion of that. All right, Jenna. I would I would really like to emphasize the uh, beauty that hybrid education can bring to us. So in our rush to come to go back to the normal, that we do, that we don't forget it and take advantage of those opportunities. All right. I don't think the students will allow teachers to go back to what was before. <laughs> they they live surrounded by technology, and now the teachers have to do it too, right? So, Catherine, will you allow your teachers to go back to the old? Absolutely not. <laughs> technology has saved quite a bit of time and money and travel costs for sure and it provides new opportunities. So sure, th sure. I think that emphasizing the hybrid balance is incredibly important here. Okay. If that's all, if I can't, I can't see any uh, hand raised up. So <laughs> I assume that uh, you've said what, what, what you plan to say. Thank you very much uh, for this discussion, for this debate today. It was about digital well-being and cyber security. And let me just uh, mention the, our speakers again before we leave. Jenna uh, Melankan, Catherine McCracken, Rachel Hendricks, Anna Rewczyńska, Łukasz Gierek and Marcin Mechler shared their experiences with, uh, with us. Uh, we'll meet again in April. And uh, next time we're going to talk about new competences, the competences of the future that will be required by the students and teachers and basically in the education business. So thank you very much for today. And uh, fingers crossed that will end finally end up uh, the bright side of the whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.